Our sermon text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, and we read in Jesus' name. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread, so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come to take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Here ends our reading. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who provides. We thank you you that you are the God who, who, when things seem insurmountable, you show the way and you lead your people. And so we pray, Lord, this morning that the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a great text for us this morning. We've been, as a church, really since about the time about a year and a half ago, maybe not quite two years, uh, we've been working our way through the one-year lectionary. And this is kind of our second time through it. We've taken some deviations here and there. But uh, one thing I have found as we look at the texts that are assigned is they always seem to be appropriate for the occasion. And I think this text in our Old Testament reading from Exodus especially are so today. As I was looking at this text, the first thing that came to my mind was the slogan from Southwest Airlines, do you want to get away? I'm sure uh, many of us have probably felt that way before, and, uh, you know, I think now this is kind of how we would want to get away now, maybe go somewhere where we can't normally go uh, with the situation as it is with COVID-19 and the shuttering of doors all across the country and the world. But I think Jesus had a different idea. When we think of Jesus getting away, he's wanting to get away from people. He's wanting what you have right now. He's wanting some seclusion with those who are closest to him. And so he, with his disciples, decide to go to the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you remember, the boats were easy for Jesus and his disciples to come by. It's very likely Peter owned a number of boats. He was a fisherman. And uh, he was told to leave everything. It's not like he just leaves his fishing rod on the side and loses you know, out maybe 20 or $30. dollars. Uh, but no, he, he leaves behind his whole, whole business to be run by others. And, and so it's likely he, he either had a boat himself or, or he knew people who did from his time there. And, but the crowds follow Jesus. He can't get away. And, and the result of this is really one of the greatest miracles. It's one of the greatest signs in in the Gospel of John, it's such a great miracle that it is one of the few things that's recorded in all four of the Gospel accounts. It's here in John 6, 
also in Matthew 14, also Mark 6 and Luke 9. And as we look at this text this morning, what we see is that Jesus is teaching us to believe, love, and trust in him regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the things that are going on in the world. And so Jesus and his disciples, they go to the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, an area um, that would be close to a town called Bethsaida. And uh, if you want to really look it up as you're listening, it's Bethsaida Julia uh, because it was named after, uh, I believe it was one of, the, one of Herod's sons, but one of the kings in the area named it after his daughter. Uh, and so here, here at Bethsaida in the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee into a desolate place. We learned some things about this place in the time that there's nowhere to get food. There's no villages very close. Bethsaida must be a little ways off. Uh, we know that it's springtime because the Passover is near and also because it's grassy. If it was the fall or the winter, it would be dried up and dirt. And also we learned that it comes to evening time, that whenever Jesus arrives, he arrives and he teaches the people we see in Luke and by the time everything is going on, we're reading here in the Gospel of John, it's, it's become late in the day. And so when we get there, we learn that Jesus not only teaches, but that, that he heals people just as he's done. And Jesus lifts his eyes, his disciples lift their eyes, and they see there's a problem. There's this huge crowd that's gathered and there's nowhere for them to go. There's no food for them to eat. And so the disciples ask, should we send them away? Should we send all of these people packing? Jesus' response, if we look at the four accounts, tells us, tells the disciples that they're to give the people something to eat. He says, you feed them. What do you have? Take care of them. In John, Jesus asks Philip specifically, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? What can we make of Jesus' actions and his words thus far? It's kind of perplexing. I think the disciples probably were looking to Jesus for answers and Jesus just turns it around on them and says, what are you going to do? How are you going to handle this issue, this problem? Well, John 6, 6 tells us that Jesus is, is doing these things to test Philip and, and then Andrew and, and by extension all of the disciples and all those who hear. You see, things are looking bad. Philip and the disciples are panicking a bit. You see, the odds appear to them to be insurmountable. How often do we look at things and, and think similarly? What can be done? What are we going to do? It can't be done. How often are we overwhelmed by our burdens or by the things that, that we think are weighing us down or the things that actually are, let alone those things, right? Philip's response to the question that Jesus asks him is, is very matter of fact. He says, 200 denarii would not do the trick, Jesus. Eight months wages, that's the way to read that, really. It would take me eight months to work, Jesus, to be able to get enough money to even just give everybody a scrap. It would not be enough. People would still be hungry. Philip looks at the circumstances. He looks at what God has provided, and he sees that it doesn't add up. Even the money they have won't add up. Then one of the other disciples, he comes, and he comes up with this young boy, and he says, this young boy has five loaves of barley, of barley bread and two fish. And so Andrew now is doing the same thing. He's looking at the gifts of God, this bread and, and this fish, and, and the fact that this boy is willing to, to share them. And he says, this is all we have. What on earth are we going to do with this? This isn't enough. And Jesus does something pretty remarkable. He does the miracle. We all know and love to read about. But we can't miss what he does just before he begins distributing the bread. 
I imagine the scene would be Philip, Andrew, Peter, uh, James, John, all the disciples running around asking people, what do you have? Can you share things? What, what can we do to try to feed everybody? That they're, they're beginning to panic. They're a little frantic. Maybe they're thinking that the crowd will turn on them if they're hungry and say, do one of your miracles. Save us, feed us, or one of those things. Or maybe just send us away. The disciples are burdened by the people who are there, who are gathered. Whatever it was that was going on, they knew that the outcome of the people not eating would not be good. Reminds me of, of, uh, of if you read through the history of Rome, you, what you find is that whoever controlled Egypt controlled Rome because Egypt was the bread basket. And, and if you had Egypt, then you could distribute bread to the people. It's the same idea that's going on here. But then Jesus' remarkable action before the miracle is the first thing he does is he tells them, sit down. He says, sit down, stop talking, stop fretting, and listen to what I'm going to do. The basic idea is the same thing that we hear about Moses just before our, our text from the Old Testament. If we look back to Exodus 14, when God's people are going towards the Red Sea, Pharaoh is pressing down upon them. They're all frantic. They're all worried they're going to die. And Moses, on behalf of God, says, Be still and see the salvation the Lord will work for you today. You see, Jesus is telling his disciples and he's telling all those who can hear him, Be quiet. Be still. I've got this. Watch what I'm going to do. This is not the time to panic. And so as to further demonstrate that, the next thing Jesus does, I think, is even more remarkable than telling them to be quiet and to be still. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says that Jesus eulogizes the bread. Eulogize just means to say a good word or or to bless the bread, similar to what we would do at home when we say, bless this food to our bodies that we may be strengthened unto your service. He speaks a good word, but here in John, it says he Eucharists the word. He gives thanks for the bread. He Eucharists the bread John, I think, is trying to connect something for us here as we go forward and as we see what happens in the rest of John 6. He's he's asking us to connect it to what happens in John 6, 35. After the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus goes and people are talking to him and he's teaching and they're pressing him and asking him questions. And Jesus, finally, he stops and he says, I am the bread of life. And then finally, in Matthew 6, 26, he gives thanks. He Eucharists the bread and he breaks it and he gives it to his disciples and he says, take, eat this bread. This is my body. John's trying to connect these things for us so that we understand that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the new covenant, the new testimony of God. And so as we look at these things and we look at at what Jesus is doing, I think it's also important for us to notice one other thing about our text in John before we move on. It's that Jesus doesn't create things out of nothing here. He's done that before, right? The Word in the beginning was with God and all things were created through the Word and Jesus is the Word we learn in John 1, 14. God created heaven and earth out of his omnipotent power. He spoke it into being out of nothing. But here, here, Jesus isn't doing quite that same thing. He's not creating the meal out of nothing like he created all things in Genesis 1 and 2. Instead, he is creating out of that which has already been provided. He's creating out of creation. He's speaking his gracious word to the people. A word that that graciously multiplies the bread so that all will be filled and none will go hungry. So when we get to Matthew 26, 26, when Jesus says the same thing, when he gives thanks, and then that this is, he says, this is my body, and this is my blood, and they're given to you to eat and drink. 
as his provision to deliver us from the forgiveness of sins, he's using the same manner. He's speaking graciously to us, not in his omnipotent power, but he's enticing and he's inviting. And through the invitation comes the work of the Holy Spirit so that way you would believe. It shouldn't be shocking to us that Jesus uses means, that he uses the bread that's there to do these things. He uses the fish that's there to do these things. He uses this young boy and the young boy's mother who probably prepared the lunch for him to do these things. Jesus then instructs the disciples to serve the people where they sit and fill 12 ba- and they end up filling 12 baskets with the leftovers. You see Jesus arranges for the people to be served instead of having to work for food, which is rightly the consequence of fallen nature of the, of sin in the world. If you go to Genesis 3, you see when God curses Adam and Eve and the serpent, he curses Adam, he says you will toil and sweat over the land which is also cursed in order to get a grain of bread for yourself. And so sin is this, the consequence of sin is the work for food, but here in this case, none of them are needing to work. They just get to sit there and receive from the hands of the disciples as if from the hands of God himself. And so as we look at Jesus' service of bread to the people here in John 6, we can see that it is greater than the service of bread that Moses oversaw in Exodus 16 from our Old Testament reading. Because in Exodus, the people had to wake up and go out and gather the quail and kill it, and they had to gather the bread. But with Jesus in John 6, the bread is literally placed in their hands and maybe even in their mouth. Think about that. In Exodus, that which was left over would spoil and rot. But here in in John 6 in the New Testament, with Jesus, there is enough bread to fill and there is even an abundance, 12 baskets, one for each apostle, one for each disciple. And none of it says it's going to rot like it did before. There's more than enough. When God in his graciousness speaks forth his favor towards you, there's more than enough to cover anything which burdens you, any sins that weigh you down. And this is what God wants to do for us, provide an abundance for us. Now this isn't a a sermon that's to say, well, pray harder, believe more, and everything will be yours. No, that's not what this means. What it means is that we believe what God has said about his word, and we see that he wants to give us an abundance in two ways both here and now and also in eternity. Here and now, God sees us and provides. We have no need to fear or be anxious because he cares for us even more than the birds of the sky or the lilies of the field. Even if we should suffer lack in this life, we can follow the example of Christ and speak a good word of blessing and of thanksgiving over that which we do have because every good and perfect gift is from God himself. This story also reminds me some of Job. You think of the testing of the disciples here. In Job, we learn that Satan isn't content with us to have anything good. He isn't content with us sitting down in the morning with a cup of coffee. He isn't content with us having even a morsel of bread. But when we look at John 6, we see that God uses situations like this to test us. So instead of pointing at the things that are going on in the world and look and see, hey, Satan is is bringing this upon us, instead we can look to, to God and we say, look, we are being tested in our faith. That's what's really going on here. We're being tested in our faith. And when we do this, when we take the work of Satan, the work of of pestilence and of disease, these things that that Satan pushes into the world upon us, and we change the narrative, we flip it on its head, and we say, no, look, this is a testing from God. We're even denying Satan the ability to tempt us. We're denying Satan the ability to come after us. We're mocking him, and we're doing so by pointing to Christ. Simply praying, thy will be done in the midst of affliction, is a great weapon against the devil himself and throws him back into his hole where he belongs. 
And so as we spend this time as scattered, and as we think of the afflictions that are upon us, the suffering, little as they may be, really, in the grand scheme of things, what we can do is know we are being tested in our faith and we're to draw nearer and nearer to Christ and his word. Ultimately, though, we are provided for abundantly, not necessarily here and now, but in eternity. Even if we should die, God's provision and comfort extend beyond this life, beyond this world, beyond the reaches of the devil. Jesus' death upon the cross and his resurrection three days later provides us the forgiveness of all of our sins. Every time we've ever slandered someone, every time we've ever uh, thought, God, why are you doing this to me? And lamented and, and thrown him under the bus. Every time that we have doubted, every time that we have wanted to yell at our neighbor for cutting us off on the freeway, every time we've ever violated God's law, no matter how great God's love is so overwhelming and abundant that it covers it all through the blood of Christ. God's love for you is never ending. He overwhelms even your current circumstances and your burdens, whether you're mourning or whether you're sequestered in your home. And he lifts you up and he entices you and entreats you to trust in him. He says, sit down. I've got this. I am your God. You are my beloved child. Believe, love, and trust in Jesus. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding be yours through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Almighty and merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your continual goodness and tender mercies, especially in sending your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, as the revelation of your saving grace and truth, your living incarnate word. We pray that Christ may so dwell in our hearts through faith that we may be filled with his endless life and daily abound in his redeeming work. We pray for your holy church, Defend and preserve her in the truth of your word. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word and continue to send the Holy Spirit throughout the world calling, gathering, and enlightening your whole church and preserving it in union with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Raise up faithful pastors and messengers, embolden Christians everywhere to be faithful witnesses, trusting that your word, like the rain, will, that will not return to you void, but will accomplish that which you purpose it. Heavenly Father, I pray especially this morning for my brothers in the office of the ministry as they labor and as they are exhausted after a week of learning new things about how to use the internet and, and live streaming and uh, cameras and all sorts of things, Lord. I know many of them are tired and weary. May their labors not be in vain. May you strengthen them and give them rest. And may you encourage them we also thank you, Lord, and praise you for the abundant goodness that you've shown through this, for all of the beautiful material that's being published online for the world to see and to learn from. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would let the light of your word to shine in our homes, enable and empower parents to teach their children by word and example the daily life of believers. Bless all centers of learning and they who administer and teach in them, and we ask also, Lord, for a special blessing upon the families of our Redeemer Christian School and our teachers. Grant that they may look to you as the fountain of all wisdom and hope. For all whom we entrust the authority to govern, we ask for wisdom, guidance, and strength. Help them to serve your purposes and establish good order, peace, justice, and prosperity for the common good. Cause the earth to yield its fruit in its season and make us responsible stewards of our resources. Give success to all beneficial occupations, to all true art and useful knowledge, and crown all such endeavors with your blessing. For all who are in trouble, want, sickness, adversity, or peril of death, especially those who suffer persecution for your name's sake, grant them strength and peace within to endure the buffeting of body and soul in the confidence that they are always in your keeping, and nothing can ever snatch them out of their Father's hands. And so, Lord, we do pray for those who regularly are not able to join us. Dorothy Morris, Elaine Roloff, 
Lydia of Brostrom, Lydia Folsom, Linda Brostrom, excuse me, Marlene, Marlene Varnas, Pauline Rice, Phyllis Wood. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them and keep them, that your face would shine upon them and you'd be gracious to them. We also pray, Lord, for the health of Andrea Ricketts, Kathy Robbins, Chrissy Ogden, Darlene Thompson, Deanne Moser, Emily Sinclair, Emily Wood, Marty Crowther, Tomoy Dunning. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen them in body and soul, encourage them in their spirit. We pray, Lord, for Jack Knutson. We ask, Lord, for a hedge of protection around him as he serves in our nation's military. We pray, Lord, for your presence to be with Bob, Mika, Mari, Matthew, and Robbie, Piper, Prosper, Francine, Cherubim, Ornella, and Noble Ruberwa. We also pray, Lord, for those who care for the sick, for our firefighters, our EMTs, police, military, technicians, nurses, doctors, and administrators who are on the front line. We pray for strength and endurance and for your protection. We thank you and praise your name for your gift of medical care, and we pray for your mercy. Most gracious Father, though we deserve the just consequences of our sins, we pray that you would graciously defend us from all harm. Protect us from false and pernicious influences in the world, from violence and immorality, pornography and lewdness, from plagues and disease, from famine and terror, and most of all, from unbelief and despair of your mercy. In all our temptation and needs, help us to turn and to trust in you as our very present help in trouble. Lord, be merciful to all, and when we reach our final hour, grant us a blessed departure from this world, and on the last day, a resurrection into your glory. Amen. We also pray now with the words your Son, our Lord, taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This time I invite you to join us as we sing our closing hymn, number 412, uh, there, oh, what is, the tw- what is it again? There is, a foundation. there is a fountain filled with blood poured forth from Emmanuel's veins. Would you sing with us? <laughs> 